Welcome to this biomechanics video where today we're going to talk about motion capture. In the video on locomotion and force plates, we talked a little bit about how the simplest model for human motion is tracking the center of mass. We see that the center of mass can really be modeled neatly with an inverted pendulum when you're walking. So that's one really easy way to get some basic information about how the human body is moving. But there's a lot of times, especially if we're starting to think about forces at the ankle or the knee or the hip, where you need to know more than just what the center of mass is doing whenever you're analyzing voluntary human movement. So for example, you might wanna know the knee angle or the ankle angle or the thigh angle. So to do that, we use a motion analysis laboratory. This is a picture from a motion analysis laboratory. There's a couple of consistent features no matter what laboratory you're using or who you're talking to. One is there's some sort of force plate, a device in the floor that measures the forces on the, the, between the person and the environment. There's a camera or a set of cameras that track the position of reflective markers that are located all over the person. You can see the little reflective balls in the image. The balls are pretty small. You can see a centimeter scale marker there. So one to two centimeters in diameter for the reflective markers. Now, there's a couple of different kinds of motion capture labs. One is active motion capture systems. One is active optical systems. So for example, Northern Digital and Phoenix Technologies make this kind of system. Um, so these bars that you see right here have LEDs in them. They're active systems. That means that the system is powered, which unfortunately means you need wires. So you can see the subject here is trailing some wires behind him. He's got this wire tail. The advantage is that each of the markers is powered and so it's accurate and it's direct marker ID. You know exactly which marker it is all the time. When you're using a passive system like the one in the picture a minute ago or the picture here on the horse, uh, the advantage is that there's no wires. The markers just, they're not connected to anything. The disadvantage is that uh, you don't know which marker is which, which can sometimes lead to problems because what the computer is doing when you have a passive system is it's, saying is there reflected light here or is there not reflected light here and where there's reflected light uh, that's the it interprets that as a one it's greater than some threshold where there's not reflected light uh, it interprets that as a zero but it doesn't have any way to say this is the marker on the hip versus the marker on the knee versus the marker on the ankle it has to rely on position because it's taking a three-dimensional position from two cameras so each camera can only determine marker positions in their planar field of view, and in order to determine a three-dimensional position, you need simultaneous measurements from at least two different cameras. The more cameras you have on a marker, the better accuracy you have on the position of that marker. Now, it takes the grid, the pixelated grid, like we were looking at a minute ago with the ones and the zeros, and interprets that as marker position. And the advantage here is that it can interpret many marker positions simultaneously. And it says, oh, that circle where it's, that's the marker. And you can kind of see in this picture that there are maybe some body segments, a foot, a thigh, the hips up there at the top and that triangle. The, one of the disadvantages to this is that a lot of your clothing actually has little reflective bits on it and those it also picks up as markers and sometimes that gets it really confused with what marker is what. So it's important to be careful there are ways to filter those out and to remove those uh, or cover them with tape. Uh, that happens a lot in motion capture labs to try and, and limit your markers to just the ones you're interested in. But that's some of the limitations of passive systems. That said, passive systems are generally more common than active systems, um, in part because of ease of use and operation, uh, and largely because the wire tail is pretty inconvenient. So here are some different uses of motion capture data. Uh, one use is for animation. So you might recognize Andy Serkis. He sort of kind of famously um, popularized this with his role of Gollum in Lord of the Rings, but it's been used much more uh, extensively in recent, recent years in movies since the Lord of the Rings kind of popularized it. In terms of biomechanics, uh, there's a lot of different applications. One is uh, cerebral palsy. One is cerebral palsy patients, uh, tracking motion of, of kids with abnormal gaits and understanding what they do. Uh, Shriners hospitals do a lot of this kind of thing. They have kind of a niche, a market niche in that area. There's also uses in ergonomics, in rehabilitation, in robotics, design, forensic biomechanics, automotive safety, sports medicine, image-guided surgery. 
the George Fox PT school has a lab where they are um, using it for running analyses for people to help them improve their running gait mechanics uh, in addition to doing a bunch of research studies for the faculty. So here's an example. You can see the marker point cloud there and you might be able to recognize that there's one foot right back here, there's another foot right here, this is an arm, this is probably the other arm, and this is probably the hip and the um, kind of the center of mass the lower back right there, that group of three markers. So you can recognize that. You have the visual capability. How do you convince the computer that that's what you're looking at? Well, what the computer sees is the X, Y, and Z coordinates at every marker in each time and space. And then to compute joint movements, you use a process of inverse dynamics analysis using the statics and dynamics techniques that we've talked about um, in order to find the following things from the marker kinematics, from the positions of the markers over time. You find the location of the joints. You find the position and acceleration of each segment and, of, and its center of mass. And finally, you find the angular position and velocity and acceleration of each of the limb segments. And then using those things um, with some more complicated models, you can uh, back out some position or some useful information from your model. So just a brief overview of segment angles and inverse kinematics. Here's a model for the lower leg. Uh, this is a little bit more complicated model because it's got two segments for the feet. Sometimes you just have one segment for the feet where you would foot where you would just use what's labeled here as four, five, and six and ignore the toes on seven. You can see some different angles uh, determined here or defined here. So theta ankle, angle 43 minus angle 65 right there with this model plus 90 degrees. The shank angle is just angle 43. The shank is the lower leg. The thigh angle is just angle 21. The thigh is the upper leg. And then the knee angle is angle 21 minus angle, angle 21 minus angle 43 to get the angle for the knee. The knee is positive and angle is positive for flexion and negative for extension. It's important to remember that. 